92 years. My, my wife and I manage Kate Farm, which is 148 acres in total, 22 acres in cultivation, plus seven 96-foot-long greenhouses. Two of the greenhouses are for seedling production, and the other five are rotated with tomatoes and greens grown on the ground. Of the 22 acres of fields, most are now cover cropped in or in small grains, grains like uh, wheat, oats, or barley. Our business has changed over the years. You know, we used to grow everything all the time, had 18 acres of veggies, went to farmer's markets for 25 years, had a thriving CSA in the 90s, and a delivery route all through northern Vermont. Uh, we're longtime members of Deep Root Organic, Organic Cooperative, a grower's co-op that sells to large accounts all along the eastern seaboard. We used to hire five full-time seasonal employees. Now we grow less variety and concentrate on fewer products. I also want to point out that I started out in a kind of a non-traditional model. I was in a partnership of five individuals that originally purchased Kate Farm back in 1981. And I owned 5% and then leased the farm from the partnership. I managed the farm business separately from the partnership. Any money I made or lost was my own doing while paying an annual rent. It allowed me to have a low entry fee to get started farming. After 12 years of farming, I had a good track record and borrowed $190,000 from the bank and bought out the other partners. It was at this point that I did my first serious number crunching. Now it is just my wife and I on the title. It may not be for everyone, but leasing farmland is a great way to get started or even as a, a permanent model. And besides farming, I also help other farmers increase their profitability through workshops and consulting and webinars like this. I also wrote this book here uh, because I saw the repeated need for farmers to look at the business side of farming. Hopefully it will help others avoid some of the mistakes I've made and provide some shortcuts to success. What we're going to do today is kind of just uh, go over some basics. Um, it's kind of veggie-centric because I'm a vegetable farmer. And um, it'll kind of go in chronological order. So, and if you have questions, you can email them. I, and uh, Kristen will sort them out and um, either ask me during the webinar or I'll address them later on. So why mechanize? It's a good question to ask. Um, I guess a, a few reasons are, you want to make the most efficient use of the labor on the farm for A, cost, cost reasons, and also if labor is in short supply. But it's also important to ask when you're expanding to enjoy the economies of scale. I hear this really often, and it's really, uh, the only time that I can think of it actually pays for, something pays for itself in a day is a $3 wire tying tool that you seal up uh, produce bags with. But generally, because people have already made the decision to buy something, they're so, they're so um, vested in it that they want it to work. So I, again, um, it's always just good to do a quick pencil test. So to do a pencil test, it's not hard. Um, what I do is I do kind of the way you're currently doing things. Can everyone see my pointer? So I can use that as kind of a tool. So basically the current way of doing things in one column and then with the other column here, you use it with how you do it with a new so tool. So Richard, can I get a pause so you for a moment? I'm not sure we can see your pointer just to let you know. Okay. Um, folks, if you can see his pointer, uh, if you could respond, say yes, so you can hit your smiley face. Um, I'm not seeing it, but that just might be me. Okay, right now it's Okay, on. so we're not seeing it, Richard. Nope, yeah. No, nope, yeah. no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Okay. Um, I'll just keep that in mind. So on the left hand column, I do, I have the kind of the way I'm doing it now. And then on the right hand column, you could have two right hand columns with a new tool or another tool. And so you do it the way you're currently doing it at the current level. So that would be the kind of the top left hand quadrant. And so washing, sorting, and bagging 4,000 pounds of beets in a tub, you know, which means, you know, you wash them, you kind of um, pull them out of the tub, you have to change the water every so often. It's about 40 hours, you know, at $15 an hour, it's $600. But if you use this new $2,200 barrel washer, you know, it's going to save you some time and it will pay back in seven seasons. But then if you up production, so if you go down to the lower left-hand corner in the orange, you know, if you up your production of beets or maybe wash carrots and potatoes and 
celeriac as, other, as well as other things in that washer, and you up the amount of uh, material going through that, then all of a sudden the payback is much quicker. And so in two and a half seasons, you would have paid back your barrel washer and still have a totally functioning barrel washer for the next maybe 10 or 20 years. So it's always, you know, it doesn't take long and you can do it on a yellow pad of paper just by doing, you know, again, the current way of doing it, planned way of doing it, and what you think you're going to save in labor or what other um, costs you might be associated with it, and then do different scales. So at 4,000 pounds, at 12,000 pounds, at 24,000 pounds. If you're not thinking of ever going more than 4,000 pounds of beets, then you have to look at a payback of seven seasons, which isn't that bad. Um, and then you still have a functioning barrel washer. So I do that with a lot of tools. I recommend everybody do that before they go out and buy something. I'm going to start off with basic uh, tractor description, you know, uh, before we start getting into the tools. This is a, you know, a 1974 Ford 4000 utility tractor. It's simple. It's a diesel. You know, we put on one to 300 hours a year. Tractors don't have um, odometers. They're measured in hours, how long the engine is running. And the key points of a tractor like this would be having a three-point hitch, which raises and lowers implements, as well as a PTO, a power takeoff, which will then spin a um, drive shaft on the tool that you're using. Some have both, you know, but most are three-point hitch. Some are just, you know, pull behind. And, you know, this is a two-wheel drive tractor, uh, which, you know, we've used for 30 years. The you know, the old timer saying is, you know, if you need a four wheel drive tractor, it's too wet to be in the field. And I think that's probably true unless you're pulling some very heavy equipment. So Richard, I'm also going to jump in here like we talked about before. So as, as, as Richard and I were, were talking about these slides, we also were uh, acknowledging and noting that there's not a, a a ROPS, there's not a, a roll bar uh, on this tractor, so I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to put a pitch both for Richard and for everybody else, uh, uh, just making sure that you're aware that there is a ROPS program. I'm going to put it in the chat box. And I, I think a ROPS is a great thing. I have one tractor with a ROPS. We have flat fields, so I felt like it wasn't as necessary. But I'm a, I think after talking with Kristen earlier that we're going to go ahead and get a ROPS for this tractor as well. So um, I think my, uh, my mic was not on, and I was just talking about ROPS for about 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Richard. Thank you for that. You can see that I put in in my chat box. There's a, a program that uh, Extension UVM Extension does uh, in collaboration with NICAM in New York State, where if you are retrofitting a tractor with a roll bar and a seatbelt, the rollover protective structures, uh, you could potentially get 75% of the cost uh, back. So there is the link. Uh, to that program, and if you have any further questions, feel free to uh, be in contact with me. Sorry about the confusion with the mic. That's great. Thanks for that, Kristen, and um, hopefully people will, I'm, I'm going to avail myself of it. So so the other um, tractor, um, again, without ROPS, but uh, is a basic two-wheel drive with a front-end loader that we use conventional dairy equipment to spread manure or compost with, and if you were to look at the far left, you can see the little blue hood of that tractor. It's a lot easier to have two tractors involved so you don't have to unhook the manure spreader and then hook it back up to the tractor after loading it. So you can just go ahead and um, load it up, drive off with the other tractor. The, I should say, too, the alternative to this technology is a shovel and wheelbarrow or pickup truck. And so, you know, obviously with the weight and the scale, you know, you need some kind of uh, mechanization for spreading manure. And the other thing we use is a cone spreader, which, you know, again, carries a lot of weight. It's basically a small agitator in there that's spun by the PTO that has a slot, that adjustable slot that meters out the material onto a spinning disc with cups and it can spread, you know, maybe 15, 20 feet to either side of the tractor. Again, makes quick, um, quick task of spreading manure. 
And again, as opposed to human labor, be a pickup truck or buckets, you know, that's only on a very small scale. A very common primary tillage tool, the discs, you know, after plowing or incorporating cover crops. Um, one point is you'll need to, to grease it regularly. I do it, you know, every half day because it's just, you know, the bearings are just sitting in dirt getting um, sandpapered all the whole time. And this is a, a favorite tool of mine because it's a lighter weight and there are no quote unquote moving parts on it except the gauge wheels. The S tines, you can see the shape of the tines kind of vibrate side to side. And you can see in this picture how they kind of tend to pull up the root hairs to the surface of the soil. But here you can see it, you know, it'll, you know, pull up the green material and then let the sun bake it and dry it out and kill the weeds very effectively. You can use this for kind of for making a stale seed bed, you know, over time every week to 10 days you do this and it will kind of kill any of those perennial weeds that you have to worry about. And then these are kind of finishing harrows. Chain harrows are a type of finishing harrow that can smooth out a field so before you put down a hay crop it's very flat. Or if you want to incorporate cover crop seeds so you would take that cone spreader and spread some oats or wheat or whatever, um, small grain and or peas and um, then you incorporate it lightly with this. It doesn't actually press the seed in, but hopefully the next rain will kind of make that nice seed to soil contact. And because it's 12 feet wide it, and you can go in fourth or fifth gear, you're moving right along. You can cover a large area very quickly. This is one of my favorite tools. This is actually called a Ferguson field cultivator. They're from the 1950s. I have a lot of equipment from the 1950s, but um, they work great. There are spring-loaded shanks. You can see the three shanks that are kind of ripping the soil, and those are spaced exactly where I'm going to be planting my rows on top of it. These are at 13-inch centers. They're spring-loaded, so if you were to hit a rock, they just kind of kick back temporarily. And they do it without inverting the soil, so you can actually stick your arm up halfway of your forearm, you know, down to the bottom where the point is, which is maybe you know, 14 inches long, and then, you know, have a very friable soil. And then I've custom made these hilling discs in the back to kind of pre-bed to basically throw some soil from the wheel tracks into the bed to start raising up my bed for um, coming back with a bed former. Again, it's a, it's a simple tool and it does a very effective job. You don't need a lot of horsepower to pull it. So here then after the say disking and then after a chisel will come through with a bed former. Now this bed former is a large mont style. It's, you know, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 years old. There's another type called press pan which basically kind of mold it like a, I'm not sure how you, how you go, but you kind of shape it by kind of forcing soil through a, a, a very smooth surface pan. But this one, the way this one works, you can see the hilling discs right behind that rear wheel and that throws more soil from the wheel tracks into the middle of the bed. Then there's that wooden board that levels it off and then at the very back is um, meeker harrows. These, I don't know if I can make this draw or not, let's see. These are meeker harrows, these round discs and those round discs kind of knife any clods and provide a very smooth um, seed bed. And the whole point of making a bed is to have something that you can transplant or seed into that will, you know, transplant or seed well as well as being flat and level so you can cultivate later on. The other thing here is these three springs on the back which are marked at uh, 13 inch centers. And those are, they make lines. So every time we make a bed, we make these nice lines in the soil that will, you know, be, we can take a hand seeder into them. We can take a two row seeder into them. We can hand transplant or run a transplanter over them. And we know that we're getting three parallel rows. And that's very important because after um, we have the plants up, we want to be able to cultivate them very 
closely, and by having three parallel rows, we're allowed we can do that. The other Richard, common can I tool. Interrupt, can I interrupt you just for a sec? Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to point out to folks. I'm hoping you're seeing it on the screen, that, and to let Richard know that your marker is working now. <laughs> good, good. So he is he's circling some of the things he's talking about on the screen. Just want to make sure folks are noticing that. And people can see that, okay? In the last slide, it was it was there. I hope folks were able to see it. Yep. Okay. So here again, I'll Great. circle this. This is a roto three point hitch rototiller, which is making a bed, and that circle is like just a five sixteenths bolt that I drilled through the back of the apron, so then I can make three parallel lines. So any time you make a bed, you're making the lines. It's really simple, and then you gauge the the width just you know like if you want to put lettuce at, uh, a foot apart you can just kind of eyeball it within the row but it's more important to get them perfectly parallel rows now rototiller is a great tool it's a one pass kind of tool sometimes gets overused and you know can beat up the soil you know which you know by fluffing it up it can increase organic matter loss and it can also create this kind of plow pan this hard layer of soil under where the tines hit um, but it's probably the best tool for you know people with limited equipment, just because it's you know simple and easy. It's really good if you can use it in conjunction with that chisel plow that I showed earlier, because that way it kind of ameliorates the effect of the the tines hitting against that layer of soil six inches down. This is a tool that I'm not personally familiar with. I've seen them. Um, I haven't used them on my farm, but it, you can go one pass from sod to here. Um, it's a spading action, and I didn't get, you don't see the guts of it, but it's kind of like, you imagine a hand shovel kind of going in and digging down and then lifting up. Um, you can still see some green material that after it's been tilled, so that could be a problem if you're going to have a cedar or um, maybe a bed former or something after that. And maybe other people who have experience with the spaders can um, chip in later at the question and answer period at, at quarter of. And seeding, um, this is great at getting those three parallel rows, you know, which is really important for cultivating. The one downside of a three-point hitch seeder, unless you have uh, some kind of electric monitoring system, is that one seeder can clog and not, you don't know about it until the crop germinates weeks later, and then you realize that one cedar head was you know, not functioning, and then you have a blank uh, row in the bed. But besides that, they work great. Um, they're you know, probably good at a bigger scale. I've used them, but I still use a push seeder because, A, the cost benefit, I don't do that much direct seeding that it takes me that long. I can seed an acre with a two row push seeder. Um, in an hour, so it's not like I'd be, you know, not tying up a lot of my time. And I really like to watch the seed drop onto the ground to make sure that I'm metering it out the way I wanted to meter it out. And again, same pictures uh, as spreading uh, fertilizer is you can spread large seeded crops like oats or wheat, peas, um, you know, not clovers necessarily, but uh, bigger seed crops for, you know, you just spread it over the ground and then you take those chain harrows and smooth them in. Another great way of seeding large areas quickly. I like this picture. I got <laughs> This is actually from uh, Andy Warhol's collection. Uh, <laughs> It, it looks like it is, but it, I, this is, I got it off the internet and I couldn't get it to the better resolution. But basically, I don't have a picture of my grain drill, which is exactly like this, but um, it's an old international grain drill from the 1950s, but it's superb for um, seeding grains. It's a drill where you're actually taking those hoppers, those red hoppers, and dropping seed through different um, hoppers into the ground. They have disc, one or two discs that open up a furrow. The seed drops in. And then um, those, that roller on the back is, they're called cultipackers. And they kind of press the seed into the soil. And they, they give you that nice, well, A, even seed bed, but also the pressing the seed to soil contact, which is so important to get things germinating evenly and quickly. You'll see a lot of these around um, 
and that's a, you know for me that's about I have a 10 foot wide model. It, it's pretty easy to see the large acreage quickly and very effectively. And mulch layers come in different shapes and you know, models, but basically what they do is they have hilling disks. Richard, can you hear me right now? I think we lost sound. Can you hear me? I think we actually lost him altogether, Kristen. It looks like uh, he bounced out of the session. I don't see his name on our list down there. OK. Um, I think he'll probably uh, notice eventually or, or rejoin us, I, I'm guessing. Um, you could uh, also give him a quick call and just have yep. him join the teleconference. Yep. I'm going to give uh, Richard a quick quick call right now. Um, so folks can hold on. I do want to acknowledge, too, that a lot of these photos, have, as uh, is clear from our chat box, um, are not do not have rocks. Uh, and, uh, and I am sorry about that. We do try to uh, have images and uh, programs with the safety equipment intact, but um, we're, that just is not as clear, is not present in, in this webinar. So I do apologize for that. I'm going to turn off my mic for a moment and uh, give Richard a shout. If folks can hang on, uh, that would be great. So I don't know if people are keeping tabs on the chat. This is Jesse here just helping out in the background. But Liz just had an interesting question while we wait here. Um, people can chime in and, you know, uh, tractor repair resources. And, you know, also I was noticing Richard is showing us a lot of um, older equipment, um, you know, that he has purchased. And, uh, you know, I know that he's a very uh, mechanically minded person and so he has a lot of skills to fix things and retrofit and you know adjust um, uh, and you know how uh, farmers learn those skills or find people with those skills to help them um, make uh, you know all the older equipment out there work on their farms and um, interesting questions. Uh, I'm not sure if other people um, have ideas on resources for farmers or how they've seen other farmers approach this issue. Great. So we're I'm just, just gonna having a little conversation. Hi. I'm back to see that. I'm sorry about that. My computer, for some reason, decided to shut down on me and um, okay. on the phone. So hopefully, so can, can folks confirm, participants, that you can hear Richard now because he's using the phone instead of his computer connection. Great. Sorry about that. So. Yeah, I'm sorry too. I'm not yeah. sure what happened there. But. And uh, Kristen. So do you want me to keep going, or you want to keep your? So discussion? Jess, what did you want to say? Jess is making a comment here. Yeah, I just was saying that we were, uh, Liz uh, Kenton brought up the question of, you know, are there um, adequate tractor repair um, services and places um, to choose from and that that can be a real limit to folks. And then we were also 
I was making note of the fact that, you know, Richard's been showing us a lot of older equipment that he is, um, I'm assuming, fixed up and retrofitted to work for his needs and um, the challenge that that can be for uh, folks who aren't, you know, mechanically minded. And so that question of pluses and minuses of, of using older equipment and uh, versus purchasing, you know, new attachments and getting everything to communicate on the farm, uh, you know, to work for your, your needs. So that's a, those are big concerns, and I think, you know, you can do that same cost-benefit analysis on a old tractor versus a new tractor, and depending on the amount of hours you use it, or on the same thing with, say, a new mulch layer versus a used one, or a grain drill versus a used one. The main stumbling block is you're going to have a lot of money tied up in your business by buying a lot of new equipment, and you want to make sure that equipment is the right equipment for your farm. And that way you don't have to worry about the repair bills as much because, you know, it's new equipment. A lot of the old equipment is so common that you can find, usually repair people to, um, and they're usually simpler made, that you can find people to fix them. It will cost you some money to do that, though. And, you know, again, um, you could probably buy a brand new tractor on time and not have to worry about repairs and be much more worry-free, but, again, it's going to tie up some of your money. And we, we can, how about we get this 11.30, we can try to get through the slides first and then we can and, and, and have that discussion. Is that okay? Does that work for you, Jesse? Okay. Yeah. Um, so is, is Christian, you're still good? Okay. Yeah, that sounds so great. So you get a yep. chance. Okay. Um, so you're on the slide of the mulch layer right now? We are on the slide of the mulch layer, yep. Okay. <laughs> And so they're very effective um, tools at laying plastic because you can do it very quickly and you can even do it in the wind. Um, the, the idea is that you have two hilling discs that kind of open up a furrow, some wheels that kind of press or tuck the, the um, plastic down, and then some hilling discs in the back that can kind of cover it up. And I would usually have someone, if we're doing a lot of plastic, we would actually just have someone walk behind. So. If the field's a little uneven, one person can lean on a one side of the bar to make it cover better or not. Or if there's little spots where they didn't get covered, just take a sh take a, his or her shoe to to cover it up. So, how about the next slide there? Chris? Okay, we're on the picture of you. So, yeah. So basically, this is one of my. It's a simple, highly effective tool. You know, it's a trolley which is suspended from a, a rail in the greenhouse. It goes from one greenhouse to the next outside, so you can load them into the truck or put them on the cold frames or just go outside to harden off and bring them back inside. You know, the alternative is waiter waitress style of one flat in each hand, which again, at 20 pounds a flat, it gets old after a few thousand flats. Um, this way, you can push 20 flats really easily on a level rail system and. There's really no moving parts except the, the trolley, the hangers that the trolley hangs from, which are kind of like a barn door slider, if you can imagine that. So another just, it's, it's, they're cheap, simple, and easy. Um, I think everybody should have one. You can do dishes and laundry with them too, probably. So next slide. This is a um, pull behind mechanical row, two row transplanter, which, um, it's an older variety of transplanter, and it has adjustable spacing within the row, and also you can adjust the two um, units to however wide you want it, but we keep them all the same width. It does a great job when you're doing bigger plantings. It's surprisingly effective at taking a tender-ish task and to placing a small lettuce plant or whatever into the ground. You think it wouldn't, but it actually does, and it's very quick. They have a water valve, so you can put a little shot of water in with each plant. Um, but a lot of times we try to time it with uh, rain or if we're irrigate, if we're irrigating anyway. And next slide. And this is kind of a close-up of a mechanical transplanter where you can see at the very top there's a pocket where you put the leaves of the plant in. Then it kind of goes down. You can kind of see it as it goes down next to the seat and then keeps going down to this little furrower. And then at 6 o'clock, the, the, the rubber pinchers open up and drop the plant into a furrow, and then those wheels kind of press it in so it just tucks it in, and at the same time gives it a shot of water. This is a one-row, and so you can make you know two or three-row models. But um, 
you can make a two row model just by taking off that middle seat if you wanted to. And so next slide. So Kristen, I'm assuming this is tapping it even though yep. it's your voice. Yeah, I had my mic turned off, okay. but you're on your uh, transplanter. Yep, you're on your next slide. Okay. So um, this is a different type. This is a, it's popular. It's great because you can go through plastic. They have a, it's hard to see, but in kind of the center, lower center part of the photo, there's a steel wheel with spikes in it, which kind of dibble the soil. At the same time, they dibble the soil, a little um, uh, plop of water comes in there, so it leaves like a puddle in the ground. And then two people, one or two people, right on the back, and just kind of place the uh, transplant into this puddle of water, and and, and slowly go along. And it, you know, it's got to be pretty slow speed to do it. But um, depending on how far apart you're putting them in the ground, obviously. Next slide. There you go. Okay, so um, this is a tine weeder, and this, you know, I, I farmed for many years without a tine weeder, and I'm like, how did I do it? It's like living without a Swiss Army knife for a while. You know, it, it was really amazing when I first tried it. I, would, I, try, I got it in the fall, and I said, okay, I might as well try it out on something. There was some fall spinach that was maybe three inches across or something like that. So I went, and I just kind of ran it over, and then I said, well, this is going to just, you know, shred everything. So I went over it very lightly. And it's hard because I was on the tractor and I kind of turning around, making sure it was working. But um, I got, I hopped off after like 20, 30 feet, and I looked down and there's not one leaf missing or shredded. And I was like, I don't even know how it's like magic because what happens is these tines are vibrating, and basically you're going off so lightly that you're kind of tickling the soil surface, and the tines vibrate and they can move around. So when they hit something, it's like even as um, minimal as a spinach stem will move around it. And so you can kind of get in row weeds of, of the whole bed without even looking because it's a blind cultivator. Basically it doesn't matter if the tines run right over the plant or not. And so the, the idea is that you get the weeds while they're very small, kind of in the thread stage and definitely less rooted than the intended crop that you're trying to save. So you could, some people, you know, put broccoli out and wait five days and then go tine weed it. You know, I've was pushing the envelope. I was doing everything from small carrots to beets to everything we grow to see how it worked. Um, it's fast. It's easy. You don't have to look. Um, and but it's not for bigger weeds. It's only for like when you're when the weeds are very very small. So we have a question, Next Richard. Um, where Brett is asking, can you sure. put all the tines down? So all our tines are down. And so basically, I'm going to show you another picture of a Williams toolbar where you can lift you the tines. You want me to do that now? And this one is a Kovar. So this is a Kovar tine weeder, which I can change the angle of all the tines, but I can't change one or two. And so I leave them all down. At this, I mean, they're all at the same level. I kind of, you know, level the with my top, my three-point pitch top link. I kind of make sure it's level. And then once it's level, I'm just going along and kind of combing the top inch or half inch of soil. And, and it's just going around the plants that are in there. It probably wouldn't work on like a head lettuce, but it would work on anything that's planted in a nice row um, just to, you know, and, and, and it'll just bend around the, the plant. So I'll show you, well, I'll get to that question a little bit later on. Um, next slide with the flame Yep, meter. there you go. Okay, so these flame readers actually very popular in the 1920s, you know, because before herbicides, and then herbicides came around and said, well, we don't really need this technology anymore. But now it's kind of coming back because of, A, organic agriculture, but also they have other uses. Um, it looks energy intensive, um, and it sounds energy intensive when you're on the tractor. But uh, it covers a lot of ground and actually is, doesn't use that much propane per acre. Um, the best use of a flame weeder is for low germinating crops that take a long time to get out of the ground, but meanwhile the weeds are coming up ahead of them. So parsnips, carrots, dandelion are some things that take you know a week or two to three weeks to come out of the ground. Meanwhile, all the, the weeds are germinated. So what you do is you flame it just before the intended crop comes out of the ground. And I do that by putting a pane of glass or some row cover over parts of the field. And that gives me like a one or two day look into the future. So once it's germinating under that pane of glass, I know the whole field is about to pop. 
I drop everything. Planning is everything with a flame meter. You drop everything and you go out in flame. So you, all the weeds have germinated. They could be an inch or more high, and you kill them by passing the flame over them. It's not burning them. It's basically just rupturing the cell walls. It's a, like a frost in reverse kind of. So it's like steaming them, and so they look like dark green, you know, weeds. Then they die back, and then next two days, you know, the crops come up without any competition. And since you didn't disturb the soil, you're not you're not um, encouraging other weeds to germinate. So they get a real big head start. It saves like, you know, if it takes normally 200 acre, 200 hours to weed an acre of carrots, you'll take about 80 hours to weed an acre of carrots. So the time saving is tremendous if you use it. And you can also use it to kill potato vines. Um, they have hand models, which are good, you know, little red dragon ones. Um, you can also flame emerging potatoes. You know, they don't like it. They'll live through it. Same thing with young corn before it emerges out of the, the leaves, and the same thing with onions. But, you know, it's better on for stale seed bed or long germinating crops. So, next so Richard, um, can I give you another question about the time reader, maybe to answer now? Someone is wondering what the, yeah. uh, Howard is wondering what the cost is for the time reader. So the Kovar was like 975 delivered, <clears throat> and I don't know, the guy, the guy out of New York State, and um, I don't remember his name, Bob Francis maybe, um, it was a while ago, but you know, so it's around a thousand dollars and I get the five foot model that I can just do one bed at a time. They make them wider, they have Einbox and another type, I'm forgetting, plus the Williams tool system, which I'll show you in a second. Great. Uh, so, so also just to let folks know, Richard, because he's calling in, can't see the s slides or the chat, so I'm reading them to him. Um, someone also just noted you can use a backpack flamer. <coughs> So backpack flamers, one row work really well. In fact, I was talking to someone who actually does um, a backpack flamer under mature kale. So you know, once the kale starts looking like palm trees, you know, and they have a thick inch or thicker stalk, you just go and flame underneath them. The stalks don't mind, and you can kill the weeds underneath the crop like that. So, but the hand ones work really well. You just do one row at a time, and it's like walking speed. You're not burning things. You're just you're just heating them up. That's all. Do you so want the next slide? Right now? Yeah. Uh, sure. We're on the okay. Okay, we're on the next it's, one. Bear sweeps. Electric, electric Alice G. Yep. Is that the one? Okay. So basically, electric this is an Alice old G. Alice Chalmers. Uh, yeah, the, uh, Alice G that they converted to run on electric. So there's four batteries right behind the seat, and then a little electric motor, and a controller. And it's just great. I love the technology, um, especially for a cultivating tractor when you use it for a couple hours and you. Use you know, plug it in and use it the next day. So here you can really see where these parallel rows are paying off. So you have these three parallel rows, and it's covering. Basically, you're cultivating. You're knocking all the weeds out in a six-foot wide area with you know either one or two passes, and um, you know leaving these three the rows maybe two inches wide where the crop is, and then that's all you're going to have to hand weed. And it's, you know, you can see on the back, behind the wheels, they have these wheel track eradicators, those little, where they look like sea tines. So basically, because the wheels press down, it kind of is a great spot to germinate weeds. But those, you know, clean up the two outer feet. And then in the middle are these basket weeders. So if you want to flip to the next um, slide, please. Okay, we're there. There's a close-up of, the, close of the basket weeders. And basically, if you do two passes, you can line up the edge of the basket on one side of the of the crop and then come back the other way and just knock the other side off so you can do this Burma shave where you really can do precision cultivating and knock out a lot of weeds. And then you can take your time meters after that and knock out any weeds that are hopefully in the row that are still pretty small. Um, the way this basket weeder works is the front basket is ground driven. It kind of is it's a ground driven implement and so basically the front basket is just kind of rolling along with the speed of the tractor and then the basket near the bottom of the picture frame is geared down so it spins a little bit faster so it's kind of like an egg beater and the great thing about this tool is that instead of throwing soil side to side it just basically whips the weeds up into the air momentarily and lets them land on the soil so they dry out in the sun and die without throwing soil into the row, and that's really important because a lot of other cultivating tools throw soil 
and you know you have to be careful when they're small but this is a very good tool for when plants are small the next slide okay and Richard I'm just going to jump in here too and just do the time check we're about 11:45 and slide 32 of 49 okay I'll talk faster <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Well, I'll do five more yeah. minutes and then we can do some questions. So this is um this is a farm wall cub with an offset seat, offset engine. Again, you can look right where you're doing, you can just look at one row. Um this is with a basket, so you can just look at one row and cultivate the whole bed in confidence. Um next slide. Farm wall cub with belly mounted sweeps. You can see this is where you know you go through and you actually can throw soil. And when you want to throw soil, it's really good. So basically, you can um, take soil from the middle in between the rows and throw them into the row. It's really good for when the crops are bigger. This is a little bit small to be using sweeps on. Why don't you go to the next slide? And you can see these are you have the tape measure, Kirsten, in your picture. Yes. Okay, um, so basically you have to have all your sweeps in a line because if you don't, then what happens is the mo the front one, if you have one in front and one in back, the front one will push the plant to one side and then kind of lean it over and then the other one will bury it. So you have to have them all in a line so they kind of prop up the plant. So next slide. And this is me on cultivating an acre of celeriac with um, sweeps that I'm bearing down so you can actually throw, I want to throw soil into the row so it's bearing this, you're kind of hilling the celeriac plants and killing any small weeds within the row. Um, so that's the other advantage of having sweeps is you can adjust the depth so if you want to really bury things in the row you can, if you don't, you don't have to. So the next slide, and that's you the Williams toolbar, is that right? Yep. So. This is where the Williams toolbar is a tool that I'm not familiar with. I've seen it, but these have adjustable tines, so it's a tine leader that you can lift up sometimes so you have less aggressive or no uh, contact with the soil. So you can, you know, if you wanted to, if you had some very small plants you didn't want that was too aggressive, you can adjust the tension on those. Um, and you could also, it has gauge wheels, and you can also put other things on the toolbar if you wanted to, like sweep. So it's kind of a one, all-in-one kind of three-point hitch cultivating tool. To be said, I didn't mention it before, but you know when you have a belly mount cultivator, so when it's underneath, it's right underneath the middle of the tractor between the two, the front wheels and the back wheels, you have so much more accuracy because when you turn your front wheel, you know you're not shifting the cultivators that much. When you turn the rear-mounted implement and you turn the front wheel, it's swinging widely much more widely and so it's not as accurate you know that's why a blind weeder is nice on the back but when you're trying to cultivate with a rear cultivating tool it's you have to be much more focused or have the plants bigger so they can take a little abuse the so next slide okay so with this one it should be a three-point hitch sweeps with a side dresser on top yes i don't it have is. a picture of mine this is off um, the internet, but basically it's a sea tines and with some gauge wheels. But the idea is that when the plants are bigger, you can go through and pretty quickly cultivate in between the rows and um, hill soil if you wanted to. They make half sweeps, so they kind of, instead of being like a V-shape, they just cut one wing off so you can get closer to the side, or if you want to get on the side of a raised bed, you can they make those as well. Um, it's very effective for cleaning up the whole farm. We just sometimes take the ones out of the middle of the bed and just use the ones on the wheel tracks and just rip up and down the rows just to knock the weeds back in the wheel tracks, um, especially when the crop is bigger, say, and we're you know a month from harvest. Um, the next slide should be okay. a PTO irrigation pump. So yep. this is a photo from the 1950s. Uh, which is about how old my system is, kind of looks the same. It's got a suction line that basically pulls water up to a, a PTO-driven pump, which then pushes it to uh, a main line, which transports it to your field, like maybe a four-inch line. And then from once it gets to the field, you reduce it down to, say, two inches or maybe three-inch laterals with the sprinklers on them. And I'm not going to get too much into this um, but that's kind of the, you know, there's different technologies, but that's basic technology right there. Uh, next slide. 
is a three-pointer sprayer. Again, I don't have a picture of my sprayer, but um, they're not that expensive. They're PTO-driven, and they have a little agitating to keep the um, tank mix, mixed up. They have different types of spray heads depending on what you're doing. Water weighs a lot, and so the alternative, again, is to have a backpack with a lot of weight on your back. Um, this can move, you can easily move a lot of water around quickly and cover a wide area with these booms that fold down to cover, you know, up, you know, 16 feet pretty easily. Next slide. Okay. And uh, so this is the store, this is our harvest. Uh, basically, we have in our pack, that's what it looks like right now, is there's a lot of feed bags stocked up with unwashed produce. Um, we don't have any. Um, mechanization here you know the alternative we just handle feed bags because they store well and easy to move around uh, we do it by hand or by hand truck um, on a larger scale you'd be you'd be using bins and a bin dumper which the you'd lift the bins around on a forklift or a pallet jack and then have a bin dumper that would lift them up onto a into a washing area the next slide and bush hog I think everybody's seen it's basically good for mowing um, crop residue or mowing around borders. Next slide. Okay. Deadlifter. This is another favorite of my quote unquote no moving parts, you know, tools because all you're doing is pulling it. It's got, if you look at the very bottom blade, it's on a slight downward angle. There's a, a water barrel there that I fill up with water for weight so it can drop down, you know, 8, 10, 12 inches. And so the next slide. Um, you, this is a, the parsnips, which are pretty long. They can be, you know, 14 inches long. This will drop down there, but sometimes we'll have somebody put on some extra weight, even on top with with the barrel. And the nice thing about the bed lifter is that it's simple. It can be slow, but it's very effective for loosening up the crops. So then you can just hand pull carrots or parsnips or beets or celeriac or echinacea, whatever you want, just with a just lifting it out of the ground. But it's also good because you can pre lift you know, two or three days worth, and then it'll store in the ground very effectively. So if your crew is varying in size, you don't have to worry about getting it all out in the ground in one day. The next slide. This is a PTO chain uh, or potato harvester, uh, PTO driven, and this is one that I custom made. I basically took one, cut it in half, made it wider, got the new apron for it so I can do a whole bed at a time very effective for separating soil from plants and you can vary the chain speed and the tractor ground speed so you can either have new potatoes with a lot of soil on them or celeriac can knock all the soil off them you know before they drop onto the ground so they're easy to pick up next slide this is a one row root harvester is that right Kristen yes it is yep okay um, this is a larger scale for when you know it's more like an FMC or Univerco one row um, root harvester where basically it will kind of pinch the carrot tops or beet tops and have a shoe that kind of lifts them out at the same time they go up a conveyor it takes the tops off separates them takes the roots and drops them on to a conveyor so they can go into a bin or a truck next door next slide um, okay. wheat um, hand option is a size it looks kind of daunting next slide and that would be okay. the 1950s all crop combine. And so that's, you know, again, old tool. This is, instead of no moving parts, this has got 73 grease fittings. Um, it works. Um, it's slow, but in grain economics are pretty tough to, you know, make it work with this kind of machinery because you're handling it so much. Next slide. And okay. post harvest is a pretty common tool, a uh, grindstone farm. Uh, barrel washer which basically rotates slowly with a, a stream of water going through the inside of it um, and it's tipped on a slight angle so you put in produce on one side and slowly um, gravity takes it down to the other side and it's the spray water spraying onto the cross but it's not the spray so much as the, the roots rubbing against each other when they're wet to clean them that cleans them off um, it's, a, it's also nice because you can keep crops at waist height. So once you're at waist height, say from a pickup truck bed, you put them into the washer, they go onto a sort table, then right there on a scale onto a hand truck or a pallet, and you know, you're know you not lifting them more than once, once you're up on that waist high level. And then the last slide is, uh, if you could put that on, Kristen, it's a brush yep. washer. 
it's a two washer or they make other ones that um, similar but basically they're a brush washer where they have an infeed table that puts them under these rolling brushes you can use them with or without water and if you have water they have also have drying sponges that will dry the crop off and then they go onto a, a slowly spinning rotary table so you can have different people at different areas pulling out calls or number ones or number twos and bag have different bagging stations okay so now it is five of twelve and those are all the slides so I'm happy to answer questions for as long as you want to do it great thanks Richard so um, um, the first question I want to ask you Richard just came in it was uh, saying so many great tools and ideas and what two to three tools would you recommend a beginning farmer evaluate first in terms of mechanizing their farm and before you start to answer that I just want to tell folks I'm going to post now in the chat box the link to the evaluation uh, for this session if you could go there when we're done so yeah you I could appreciate answer that, if people can if people can fill out the evaluation it helps everybody concerned myself just so we can do better jobs at um, and making presentations. So what tools, you know, I think it depends on what you're doing, but you know, if you know, if you just have one utility tractor, I'd probably have a three point hitch cultivator. The biggest thing in, you know, making money farming in the vegetable world is going to be the biggest cost is going to be weeding. And so if you can eliminate you know, streamline that and harvesting. Harvesting and washing. So the tools that I would recommend would be like simplest would be a three point hitch cultivating tool to get in the row and then having some like a bed lifter maybe um, and then a root washer those are things that are just going to speed up immediately and pay for themselves um, you know the hand flamer is another good one if you're going to only if you're going to do those long germinating kind of crops but you know that's a forty dollar tool um, I think I'd probably if I was starting out I'd get a utility tractor 40 horsepower utility tractor with some clearance probably two-wheel drive and I'd get a rototiller that's 42 inches wide or something like that, three-point hitch cultivators, um, and, and you know, and a, and a seeder, maybe those precision seeders like a, a two-row, get two-row earthway seeders and bolt them together. But I have a list and if you want, email me and I will email you a list of some equipment for one to three acres and five plus acres. That's great, and if we could also just send that out to everybody, Richard, we could get that. Yeah. How about I send you. it, Kristen? I'll send it to you, and then you can yep. disperse it about that. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, sure. So I just this is a comment uh, made by uh, Terence Bradshaw that farmers who mechanize need all in capitals to either develop comprehensive mechanical skills in a proper shop or hire a farm employee, the shop and crop person. So new equipment needs just as much maintenance as old. I didn't know if you'd want to comment on that comment. The new equipment does need some. It does, well, it depends on what it is. I think new equipment needs less, but old needs some. I mean, you still need to change your oil and your tractor and service it, grease it. But um, you don't have to necessarily take apart the rear end of a new tractor. Hopefully. Um, but I would hire it out. If you're not mechanically inclined, I'd hire it out and I'd try to get a relationship with someone, like an old timer around that can help you out and just on your side instead of, you know, billing you at $100 an hour. Um, but it's, a, it's an issue. Um, I understand that, you know, and that's part of the job, I think. Great. So as, as we are getting to noon, I just want to say Richard did say before we started, let me know he could hang out and, uh, Answer questions for folks who have to for folks who can stay past the uh, 12 o'clock hour. Um, but if you need to sign off, just again a reminder about the evaluation and thank you very much for joining us. Um, and then I will move us to the next question, um, which is from Jen Colby, which is as far as brush hogs, are there different variations of that for clipping? A pull behind brush hog doesn't seem to clip high enough off the ground for farmers I work with. So I guess um, if you wanted to, you know, just take off seed heads, um, I've got a disc mower which can go a little bit higher, and we can mow off a little bit higher than that. They're a little bit, they're much more expensive. They're very effective tools, but need more horsepower. Um, you could do that with a sickle bar mower, which is a three-point hitch, in which you can raise it up as high as the hitch would go, which might be a foot and a half or something like that, maybe higher. Um, other than that, I 
Yeah, I'd have to think about it. So, Jen, you can just email and, me, and, and if you're going, if you're not satisfied. And Harry McGovern just put in, I think, a response to that question, which was a uh, flare mowers, F L A I R. Flail mowers, L. Ah, it's an R to be yeah. L. Okay, flail. Sorry. Yeah, so basically, the flail mower is kind of like a rotary. How do I describe it? It's like a rotary drum with chains on it, which basically can, you know, just spins and use that action to, to take off the, the crop. And, but I don't know how I've used them, but I don't know. How, I've never thought about doing it high. So. Any other questions from folks? We can wait, hang on for a few seconds here in case anybody's typing. Sorry about the snap. I hope they didn't screw things up too much. No, I, did, I, I hope it's going OK, folks, We're working with the telephone call in. And we did get another question, Richard, which was, how many hours do you think a beginning farmer needs to spend on driving the tractor to be good at those precision tasks? We had a workshop here a couple of years ago um, where we had a cultivation workshop and we went through all the different cultivation tools. And at the end of the workshop, we actually put people on the tractor. We said we had two tractors out in the field and they said, okay, you need to get on the tractor and do it. And so they went ahead and went 30 or 40 feet. But just the sense of being that, I train a lot of people doing that. And I can train, I would think I could train most anyone within half an hour, check on them again, and they're good to go. Um, but it's a lot. It's a lot easier if you do it on somebody else's tractor with some guidance, and then come back to your own farm. It's a little unsettling getting on top of a track, on top of a bed, straddling it, and doing. You could do some serious damage um, very easily. But once you get your confidence up, I mean, it would really take any long. It takes you 30 seconds to get your confidence up to realize that you're not doing damage. And I always recommend, you know, pushing the clutch in every 40 feet at first bopping the tractor and looking around and seeing if everything's all right and then keep doing it until you feel comfortable doing it. And maybe that's a workshop that will happen at the end, but, you know, that's the kind of workshop that is really helpful to actually actually see these different tools but actually sit on the tractor. Great. Can you take another question here, Richard? Absolutely. Yep, yep. And I have to be honest, I hope I'm reading this right, but um, so how do you use the recovery value of a tractor in a pencil test equation, assuming it's still in good shape? OK, I'll do that. It's going to be a little hard on the phone, but maybe you can help me, Kristen. Um, uh, let's take a 40 to 50 horsepower used tractor, say like that Ford 4000 you saw. OK, so that's a 1970s tractor. So you take a used tractor that's 40 to 50 horsepower, it's a two-wheel drive, no bucket. That's going to probably go for about $5,000, OK, if you were to buy one of Craigslist today. So let's say you use it for 10 years, and you put fuel into it, and, you've, and you do repairs on it. And at the end of 10 years, it might be worth, it'll be worth something, obviously, if you've kept it up. Some say, let's say it's worth 1000 Let's say it's worth $2,000. It's probably worth it if you keep putting money into it. So that means over the 10-year period, it costs you $3,000 to fix to own this tractor, OK? So over 10 years, it's $300 a year just to annually own it. So then the other costs are going to be repairs and fuel. And repair is going to be some years there's going to be a lot, and some years it's just going to be an oil change. But say on average, it's going to be $400 a year. That would be $4,000 over the 10 years. So that's probably about right. So $400 a year for the repairs, and then fuel, depending on how much you use it for, is going to probably be three to four hundred dollars. So say it's for round number, say three hundred dollars of fuel, that comes out to be a thousand dollars a year to own and operate this tractor. So a thousand dollars a year, if you use it a hundred hours, that's ten dollars an hour. Okay? If you use it two hundred hours, that's five dollars an hour. You might have a little bit more fuel involved. But you know, to give you a basic sense of how that works you can do that with a brand new tractor. You can spend thirty thousand dollars on a brand new tractor, sell it ten years later for twenty-two, and it's going to cost you eight thousand dollars to own it. But you're going to have very few repair costs. And depending on the level you use it, it's going to probably be in the 
10 to $15 an hour range to use his brand new tractor. The, the caveat is that when you have a tractor that's, say, costing you $1,000 to, you know, to put repairs in and fuel it and own it, if you only use it for one hour, it's going to cost like almost a thousand dollars for that one hour. So you, you know, you don't, you want to, you know, gauge how many hours you use a tractor, which might be a hundred to two hundred hours in a year. Um, if it's a lot less, like a cultivating tractor, you might only use fifty. The cost per hour is going to go up. But you can figure the cost, the annual cost of ownership, first, and then divide by the amount of hours you use it. Does that make sense? Well, so I'll let you know if um, someone responds as to whether it makes sense. Did um, it make sense to you, Kristen? <laughs> yeah, yes, it did. And I am also just wanted to say um, I will listen to the recording of this and write down your notes and try to come up with a sheet so it's written that people could download and look at uh, that covers your response. Okay. And that would be helpful for folks. Um, and I think we did get a response that, yes, uh, it made sense from a couple okay. folks. Um, so can a follow up to that, Richard, if it's okay to go on just a little bit more here, um, sure. is following the question that was just asked, how do you apply your tractor investment across multiple enterprises? Is it by hour and percent time or by its labor value? How do you do that? So when I do a crop budget, I will, you know, I assign, I know it my, I would do the test that I just did previously about each tractor and it comes out to be about five to ten dollars an hour that it costs me to own and run these tractors without a person on them. And so then I add the labor of the person sitting on that tractor and that gives me I use those for my crop budgets for when I you know, if I use a tractor in my car acre of carrots for um, twenty hours, I would just multiply it by the ten dollars an hour plus the labor and it would that's how I use it for my budget. So basically, I, I figure the cost of my tractors first and then plug them into my budget, just like I would plug my average labor cost into a budget. So we've got another question that's a little different. Is I, I manage a farm where I'm slowly adding equipment. This is Jen Burt's question. All I have for tillage right now is a rototiller, and I have a spring tooth harrow that I borrow, but I'm currently wondering what is the next piece of tillage equipment I should buy for a three-acre vegetable operation. So those two tools are nice because the, the rototiller is good for making beds, and the spring tooth or S time, the harrow is good for like kind of getting land prepped or open or seeded into cover crops. I'm thinking, you know, once you get to the three-acre scale, you're going to want to start thinking about cultivating for weeds. And so you take your your same tractor and get a three-point hitch cultivator, which have adjustable, you, know, you can get them so they swing back and forth, so you can adjust them pretty easily depending on the crop, and um, use that to try to definitely knock out weeds in the wheel tracks, and definitely when the plants get bigger to knock out rows weeds in the row. Um, that would probably be my first step. And then um, as you get bigger and you do it more and more, you're going to probably want to move to a belly mount, you know, cultivating tractor with a, a set of baskets um, for when the plants are really small. You know, a flame leader might work depending on what kind of crops you're going to grow, but again, you can get these $40 heads and use a barbecue tank um, to, to do flaming on a small scale. I'm trying to think of other tools that, you know, jump out at me. Um, but, you know, using a rototiller, I definitely put some three bolts on the back of that or C clamps or whatever you can, you know, put them on and mark them off. Decide if you want to do 15 inch row spacing, that would be 30 inches from the two end ones. I use like three row because that way you can, you know, do two rows on the outside, one row in the middle or three rows across the bed. And if you do a four, 15 inch centers or 14 inch centers, I do 13 inch centers because I have a, that um, chain digger that doesn't go any wider. Um, but yeah, t just make sure you're making those beds. When you're making the beds, plan in parallel. That way, when you cultivate, you'll be all set to go. Are you still there, Kristen? Hi, Richard. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Sorry yep, about that. Yep. 
Yeah, so yeah. we did have one more question, uh, which is, what do you think of equipment sharing arrangements? Pros, cons? Pros, I'm a big fan of sharing equipment, um, except the fact that certain equipment is hard to share. It's, it's like hanging equipment is hard to share because when the time to make hay is, you know, there, everybody needs the same equipment at the same time. Certain equipment is easier to share. Certain things I don't share, things that, like my combine or things with a lot of moving parts, I'm hesitant about lending out. Um, I would, the no moving parts, things like a bed lifter, no problem. Um, so I like that model of, you know, not everybody owning everything all the time, but certain tools you might want to own yourself, like, you know, the primary tillage, rototiller. Um, and, you know, it depends. I mean, it depends on the scale and, you know, how often you need it, but if you can share a bed former or share a bed lifter or, you know, those kind of things would be easy enough to do. Um, even cultivators. And you know, the one thing maybe would just be to watch for, you know, seed contamination so you don't get weed seeds coming from one field to the other, but you can just hose it off between farms. Great. I think that that might be it for the questions. Uh, folks, if I missed anybody's questions, I'll see if I can um, uh, pursue a response from Richard via email. Um, we will be posting a recording of this session up with, within a week, probably within a couple days. Um, and Richard, I really want to thank you for your time and your terrific presentation. Um, and to remind everybody that our next webinar will be April 10th. And Richard, you're having some nice comments flowing in with thank you, great info, nice pics, thanks, great presentation. Just for you to know because you can't well, see that. <laughs> It was great. Well, thanks, and uh, um, I'm glad it was helpful. Great. Thank you, everybody. More soon. Okay, I'm going to sign off. All right, off. take care. Bye bye. See you. Yep. Bye bye. Okay.